where fresh off a of fixation on bees, and you know what bees do? They pollinate. Pollen eight. I'll see myself out. What are you gonna be when you grow up? A burden on society. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lady Genevieve, and on my channel I like to talk about entertainment media. In today's video, we're going to talk about Netflix's Bridgerton. We're going to talk about pollen. We're going to talk about storytelling and romantic fiction. Required reading is not the book, or any of the Bridgerton books for that matter. Required reading is my previous video about anyone but you and its many Shakespeare Easter eggs. Some cupids kill with arrows and some with traps. That was good, I like that, that's good. I just made it up. It's funny how insistent some folks are about wanting me to break my own rule by reading the Bridgerton books, but when I do embrace my inner literature girly, hardly anyone wants to show up and hear me talk about the classics, which YouTube was all too kind to let me know about. I am invisible and I am wet. But thank you to those of you that did show up to that video. It was a fun passion project to make. I'm used to my passion project videos flopping though. Baz Luhrmann's Elvis, you will always be famous and I will never regret doing a giant video essay on you. Lord have mercy. Maybe this is why I'm a Benedict girly. I relate to his creative angst. Ferre, Armani, and Versace. Now, what are we talking about today? New promo? No. I have hardly anything of note to say there. You will not have the audacity to release promo in a vertical aspect ratio without a widescreen version available and expect me to talk about it. If I go to the store to buy new trousers and the only thing that you give me is a single square of fabric to place on my thigh, I'm gonna throw it back at you because it's incomplete. You have ignited my inner film snob. She's activated. Nah, yo, hold my poodle. Hold my poodle. Hey, yo, what's up? Y'all got a problem? That's a you problem. Release real promo and then we can have a conversation. No, dear viewers, today we will instead briefly talk about a different thesis that began to coagulate in my cranium. One that is largely about Colin Bridgerton and Penelope Featherington, but also the thread that weaves them together with all of the main couples we've seen thus far in seasons one and two. But first, a cat cutaway. Yuki is doing well. She's turning into a real mush. She's extremely needy and just wants to be pet and snuggled all the time. So I know she's going to be a great fit with her adopter and her babies, Marilyn and Monroe, are fully escalating into hyperactive kitten behavior. Furthermore, donation links for Palestine and Gaza are in the description box, but if you're going to send donations on things like PayPal, please don't use the words that I just stated that begin with the letter P or G because unfortunately some people have been having problems with their accounts getting shut down and their funds not being distributed when those words are included. Let's talk about the infamous breakup of the season two finale. Let's talk about Colin Bridgerton, Mr. No Thoughts Head Empty, being at the absolute peak of his head emptiest frequency. Mine is an idiot, oh, but it's my idiot. Let's talk about, I would never dream of courting Penelope Featherington. Excuse me, what is your problem? Now, as much as I like to drag him, roast him, and make no mistake, I stand by all of that. I don't take it back. Today, I'm going to explain why this scene was necessary for the overall storytelling. I would never dream of courting Penelope Featherington. Not in your wildest fantasies, Fife. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew who they were, and I told her who they were. Shitheads. We're going to talk about Pollen's narrative, but we're also going to put this in the context of the larger Bridgerton universe, since this is now season three that we are entering, and we have two love stories that have already played out before this one. But first, we need to take a step back and look at the bigger picture of the Bridgerton premise. Netflix's Bridgerton is a Regency AU. I know there's books that serve as source material to some extent, but those books are wider than succession. You're basically white. That's true. I've never even watched that show, but I did see Joyride, so I'm assuming the punchline lands. Name every character on succession. Logan, Kendall, Shiv, Rome. Oh, yeah. So? Now, I'm by no means a historian, but I've seen my fair share of Regency set romances, so there's a very specific type of love language that I've grown accustomed to with a particular set of rules and guidelines that are either implicitly or explicitly explained to the audience. Perfect example of this, Northanger Abbey 2007. Am I bringing this up just as an excuse to put J.J. Field's Henry Tilney back in the spotlight? Yes and no. It's a really good example to explain my point, but any excuse to reference him, I will happily take that. J.J. Field's Henry Tilney, you will always be famous. Miss Morland's girl. Miss Molensgown is very pretty. I am not horny 
at all. Let's go to the scene where they first meet Henry Tilney. Our protagonist, Catherine, is staying with family friends, Mr. and Mrs. Allen. She's at a ball and she's walking around with Mrs. Allen when suddenly, collision. Oh, oh, uh, have a care, sir. Thousand apologies, Mom. Mrs. Allen is worried about a pin in her dress, fabric getting snagged. Catherine, do take this pin out of my sleeve. It, it was not your fault, sir. Allow me. Oh. Whatever, the details aren't all that important. What is important is that Henry Tilney is all politeness and he helps her out with the pin. The word muslin gets mentioned and before you know it, they start talking about fabrics. Five shillings a yard and a true Indian muslin. What do you make of that? Well. It's fashion. Is it fa <laughs> Wait, but is it fashion? It's fashion. <laughs> Now, Henry Tilney, he's a playful, friendly, extremely agreeable fellow, but he's also of that upper class background and thus he's all too aware of what the rigid rules of social decorum are that he's supposed to be following. So he helps escort the ladies over to get seated and he's also iconic whilst doing so, glaring at these random men to clear off so that these ladies can sit down. Gentlemen. Well, you know, to... Uh... Be fertile. You see, Henry Tilney has promised to make amends. You must allow me to make amends, Mrs. Allen. So he heads off and gets the master of the ceremonies, but before they make it back to Catherine and Mrs. Allen, Mrs. Allen tells Catherine that technically she wasn't supposed to let Catherine and him speak to each other when they had not been given an introduction. Really, I shouldn't have allowed you to speak to him as a stranger. But he had such an understanding of Muslim. This is one of those weird, entirely silly rules of decorum that are part of the Regency setting. You can't even chat someone up until you have been formally introduced. How can you be so presumptuous? Indeed without so much as an introduction. So for example, if we go back to Bridgerton season one, Daphne and Simon were not supposed to start talking to each other because no one had made that introduction for them. They met under similar circumstances to Catherine and Henry Tilney, circumstances involving accidental physical collisions. Oh, oh, uh, have a care, sir. A thousand apologies, Mom. Oh. Pardon me. Forgive me. Brittany and Tiffany Wilson, now Daphne started chatting him up out of desperation, that very female or femme survival instinct of what do I have to do to escape this creepy man who will not leave me alone and is making me feel unsafe. Oh, yes, I don't know it. Yes, thank you. Tell me your name. Your name, sir. But Daphne and Simon were not able to really start talking until Antony had come over and made that introduction. Oh, the Duke of Hastings, is it? Right, Hastings, this is my sister. Your sister. Anthony already knew Simon because they were already friends. Daphne, Hastings and I knew each other from our days at Oxford. Days we shall not soon forget. And Anthony already knew Daphne because Anthony is Daphne's older brother. So once that introduction had been made, they had a bit more freedom to approach one another at these types of events as they saw fit because by that point they had been acquainted. Just as Henry Tilney was more free to talk to Catherine once he got the Master of Ceremonies to come over and make that formal introduction. Mrs. Allen, Miss Morland, allow me to present to you Mr. Henry Tilney, just lately arrived in Bath. Mrs. Allen, Miss Morland, delighted to make your acquaintance. Now, admittedly, Henry Tilney was far more entertaining in his approach to this social rule because he at least had the good sense of humor to outright mock the rule, even if he does go along with it. Now we may talk to one another. We've already been talking. You mustn't allow anyone to hear you say such things. We shall all be expelled from polite society. The thing you have to remember about all of these Regency romances, it's a point I've repeated ad nauseum. They predominantly or more or less entirely focus on members of the upper class, or if they're really feeling edgy, the upper middle class. Remember when the middle class was a thing that existed? I'm really glad I don't have kids. So there's very little that exists to create an actual conflict in the relationship that translates to something equivalent to the material living conditions of the lives of the audience consuming these stories. There is admittedly an economic pressure on the women to find husbands, but none of these lead characters will have to ever work for a living. So a lot of what goes on is this silly superficial conflict that comes from extremely archaic rules of how people can socialize with one another. Now, how does this relate to Netflix's Bridgerton besides 
besides physical collisions being a form of meet cutes. Well, this was some meet cute. Well, the rigidity of social decorum is one of the few pressures that the Bridgertons have to deal with. For as heavily as the economic insecurity weighs on a lot of the other female characters who have to navigate the marriage mart, characters like the Sharmas or the Featheringtons, or even the male characters if they're not generationally wealthy. Can I get a hell yeah for Will Mondrich? I saw that going differently in my mind. I personally never feel the emotional stakes of economic insecurity for any of the Bridgertons, even if those are women. They are just too loving of a family for me to believe that anything bad would ever happen to any of those girls, even if they decided to not get married. Could be as high as 14 billion lira. 14 billion? Yeah. I can't afford that. So if the rigidity of social decorum is one of the main external pressures that is consistently felt for the one fixture of the show, that being a member of the Bridgerton family always being one of the people in the main couple of any given season. What Netflix's Bridgerton has to consistently do is break those rules of social decorum. A lot of discussions can be had about how each season is a different romance trope. Season one is fake dating, season two is enemies to lovers, season three is friends to lovers. But when you look closer at these stories on a conceptual level, in actuality, all of these love stories are doing the same thing, which is that we have the main couple of that season breaking the rigid rules of social decorum in upper class Regency society. Simon proposes to Daphne that they pretend to be courting because Simon wants to keep away all the other ladies ladies of the town and their mothers that want to try to secure the bag by getting engaged and married to him. Perhaps there is an answer to our collective Lady Whistledown issue. It would solve that problem for me and that problem for you. Daphne wants to secure a good match and Simon knows that straight men are weirdly insecure and competitive with one another. So if Simon, a duke, is interested in Daphne, then I too want to try to compete for her affections. Among other things. But since Simon and Daphne think that they're not really courting, they feel more free to speak openly with each other, which means Simon can tell Daphne what happens late at night when she is alone. And eventually you reach the pinnacle, her release. Have fun DJing in between your legs tonight. Wake it, wake it. Then with season two, Kate is really the driving force behind the breaking of decorum. In her mind, she is not pursuing a match for herself. She is not participating in the marriage mart in any way other than a guardian figure doing anything and everything she can to help Edwina to secure a match and by extension secure the bag. Antony and Kate met randomly and that spark was already there between them. It was apparent. Quick sidebar, I just want to point out that this is my personal type of enemies to lovers that I like to watch. I don't like when the trope of enemies to lovers is executed by way of one half of the couple being a person who wants to literally do mass unaliving on a large scale. No, sweetie, that's called a villain that needs to be taken out. Death to the enemies of the people of the Republic. Kate and Antony meeting for the first time, there's a spark between them. You immediately buy into them as a couple. You can feel the chemistry, you believe it, you're immediately captivated, and you're having a good time. Or was it not? Does one not need actual competition for a race? We could say that if we had decided on a finish line together, but alas, we made no such agreement. So you know that you're ready to watch them fall in love, but then a misunderstanding. The guy must say something terrible and foolish and the narrative will tell him off for it, but it's going to jumpstart the delicious bickering that's going to be unleashed on their relationship dynamic until they can really start to peel back the layers of themselves on an emotional level and they will fall in love. This is the exact trajectory that was followed in anyone but you. Uh, honey, about to order, do you want your usual? Uh, meet cute in a coffee shop, there's a spark, they're cute together, and then misunderstanding. Guy says something rude. Fuck that. I couldn't get her out of here fast enough. This girl's a disaster. She's a nothing. And now bam, we've got bickering, we've got verbal sparring. No, thank you. I'm all good on creatine and small dick insecurity. Nothing small about me. But eventually, they're going to realize they love each other and they're better off being together. This is also extremely in alignment with Pride and Prejudice. She is tolerable, I suppose, but she's not handsome enough to tempt me. For Kate Sharma, she had probably considered Antony for a couple of minutes when she saw him again at that first ball. Number eight. I know that gentleman. 
Who? The Viscount. I do not believe I've yet made an introduction. We've already been talking. You mustn't allow anyone to hear you say such things. We shall all be expelled from polite society. I don't think she was considering him when they met while riding horses. I think she was running on pure adrenaline and he was the one who fell first. I love you. I've loved you from the moment we raced each other in that park. We've not yet been introduced. I'm afraid that is not possible. Not when I have a victory lap to enjoy. <laughs> if she hadn't run off because she was running late, he absolutely would have tried to start courting her right then and there. But at the ball, her feet are planted firmly on the ground and she doesn't need to run off anywhere. So she can actually stop to consider him. She can contemplate that spark that she felt. And she decides, actually, no, men ain't shit. Your character is as deficient as your horsemanship. Your character is as deficient as your horsemanship. I shall bid you good night. So this liberates Kate from having to be polite. She is not trying to court or marry this man for herself, nor does she consider him to be a suitable match for Edwina. So on both ends, she has given herself the green light to drag him at any and every opportunity. Dragging does not exactly follow the rules of decorum, but it sure is fun to watch. But also in addition to everything I've now read of you, your dubious and libertine reputation goes before you. I guess I just grew out of it. Really? Because you seem kind of tense <laughs> from all the no boning. You sure you're good? You sure you don't miss it? <laughs> that is what gives Antony the green light to be even more feral and unhinged than he usually is. He'll tell her exactly what he thinks of her. You are the bane of my existence. And the object of all my desires. How he feels about her. And it's maddening. How much you consume my very being how tormented he is by her in every sensorial way conceivable. I am a gentleman, and you are a lady of that, that scent. Mm. So even though Kate and Antony's energy with each other is extremely different from Simon and Daphne, they have this commonality of, well, we're not dating each other, so we can be real. The veil is lifted and you're going to see all the highs and lows of me. You'll get to know the tea. Now, whether that tea is that you've never experienced la petite mort. You used to touch every once in a while. Now you, what, touch yourself? Or the tea is daddy died from a bee sting and now I'm capital T traumatized. It's okay. It's not the end of the world. No, it literally is the end of the world. Either way, they get to exist and behave and communicate outside of these rules of Regency marriage mart decorum. Now, if you're a pollen only type of Bridgerton viewer and you've made it this far, thank you for your patience. I promise I'm getting to them now. And I'm at the aforementioned talking point that I put in the title of this video. Their so-called breakup scene in the season two finale. I would never dream of courting Penelope Featherington, not in your wildest fantasies, Fife. <laughs> 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 like I've said before on numerous occasions, what Colin said was foul and I don't like what he said at all. But in the larger journey of their relationship, it is necessary to jolt this relationship onto the trajectory of being the main coupling of a season. Unlike Simon and Daphne or Kate and Antony, we've already seen Colin and Penelope interacting with each other before it was their turn to be the top build couple of the season. Penelope has repeatedly been described as a wallflower. She tends to stay a bit more low-key than some of the more ostentatious members of the ton. Water? Yes. Water, please. Thank you. It's so loud! <laughs> but when it comes to Colin, they have made a point of showing them as friends already. For one, Colin calls her Pen. Now, you can ascribe more meaning to that because it's a nickname instead of her full first name, Penelope. But either way, the point is that Regency decorum, especially in the marriage mart, dictates that people would have been referring to each other by their surnames. I am a woman. You are Pen. You do not count. You're my friend. Of course. Your friend. Three hours later. Good night, Mr. Bridgerton. They also correspond with each other beyond just the times where they're around each other at these social events. They are pen pals whenever Colin is traveling. I thought you would have been bored of my travels by now. You read and replied to more of my letters than anyone else. I suppose I did. 
Actually, I think you're kind of terrific. But none of these things are quite enough in the grand scheme of rule breaking to facilitate a main couple of the season sort of energy in their relationship dynamic. Any sort of sparks that we've observed up until this point have been at most simmering. What we need to see is boiling, a boiling kettle screaming on a stovetop because the tea is ready to be served. Penelope in particular is where we get to watch the most distinct transformation. And I'm not just talking about the wig upgrade, which I've mentioned several times because I love it so much. We need to see her energy shift more than anything because she has had Mr. No Thoughts head empty up on a pedestal. And for what? Girl, wake up, stand up, and throw the whole man away until he transforms as much as you did and comes crawling back because it's time for groveling. When we see these exchanges between Colin and Penelope in seasons one and two at places like these different balls or at the races you can see how heavily she is censoring herself she is keeping so much of what she thinks and how she feels tightly locked up and that is not main character energy not on Bridgerton anyway the main couple always has to start expressing themselves more and more and defying these rules of social decorum at least with each other maybe not on a grand scale to all the members of the ton but they 100% have to be doing that with their end game love interest they there was always so much more to say than one could put onto the page. All these times that Colin played in her face, I discovered someone, myself. She should have thrown him into a mud puddle because how very dare you? Myself. Yourself. How very dare you? <laughs> Never been so insulted. Now, before any of you pollen shippers get ahead of yourselves and think that I'm coming for them, I'm not. I'm simply going through the timeline of their journey. They have to be different before it's time to transform into main characters. And on a lighter note, I will call attention to one of my favorite Penelope moments pre-season three. It's the part where she spots Colin at the races and she starts looking around pretending that she doesn't see him until Colin calls out to her first. Nicola Coughlin, the iconic comedienne that you are. Pen. Oh, Colin. <laughs> Stop it! Yeah. I have something to say! Shut up! See, it really doesn't matter to me in the grand scheme of things where I rank Pollen's story in the larger ranking of all the Bridgerton couples that will be acted out in live action because a Pollen season means that they're going to let my girl Nicola Coughlin unleash the wrath of Penelope O. Featherington. There was a time and place for Wallflower Penelope, but now it's time for her to act up. I need her to be a problem for Mr. No Thoughts Head Empty. But when you have so clearly communicated that this girl is keeping to the sidelines, not really being noticed, which is how she was able to be so obviously Lady Whistledown, but nobody in the ton was able to be smart enough and figure it out, except for Eloise, the only way you can shock her out of this lifelong pattern of behavior, she needs to experience something really drastic. Colin Bridgerton, in all his pasty, generationally wealthy glory, needs to completely shatter this idealized portrait that she has built up of him in her mind and in her heart. This is no longer the sweet, naive girl who thought this man could do no wrong. This is an angry woman who is no longer coddling the feelings of a man when he has made it very clear he would never dream of courting Penelope Featherington. Penelope O. Feather is rage personified and that's what I love to see. A woman with righteous anger and a man who's not very bright falling in love with her for that. Now why does that sound familiar? Wait, wait, I just want to say thanks for killing those things. Ah, damn! James Cameron, the man that you are, doing it for the romance girlies since before I was even born. And I thank you every day for that in my mind and in my heart. I already talked about Will Gluck doing it for the Shakespeare romance girlies and a whole lot of you skipped out on watching that video, but you will not stop me from doing my inevitable James Cameron video because that's my guy. I want him to teach me how to write iconic love stories and I want him to teach me how to build submarines and I want him to teach me how to fist fight. You know what that's called? range. So even though at the time of recording this video there has still not been a full season three trailer released nor have I read the book because I want to be surprised when watching it for the first time and I don't want to bring those book biases into my first watch. From what little information has been sent to me by way of things like basic press announcements in my emails with log lines about the premise of season three. Even if I just go off of those two sneak peek clips that have been revealing the jumping off point of Pollen's love story what do we see in the sequential order of their release? First, we see her play acting how she might express herself to a potential suitor. Your eyes. The most remarkable shade of blue. But we're going to cough, cough our way through that because we're definitely not flirting with each other. No, 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 no. I, I said remarkable shade of blue, but I wasn't talking about your blue eyes. 
that are staring me down right now. No, 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 no. Yeah, I see how you might have been confused. I definitely wasn't talking about you. I definitely wasn't looking directly into your eyes. You definitely weren't looking directly into mine. No, 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 I'm just play acting. Ha <laughs> ha, wait, why are you looking at me like that? Let me just look away and, and cover it up with awkward mouth noises. Mm. Um. Um. <clears throat> and then we have the second clip, which was really the more iconic clip the dragoning of Mr. No Thoughts Head Empty. Thank you very much. I will be accepting this gift on behalf of myself and my burning need to see him dragged by the ankles. It just never occurred to me that you of all people could be so cruel. This is really where we got to see her yank the mask off. She is no longer sugarcoating anything with him. She is showing her true self to him. And of course, by extension to us, the audience, we no longer have to interpret her thoughts and feelings based on the expressions and nuances of how she emotes or the actions she takes. I also think it's worth noting that even though this is first and foremost a romance show where there's a main couple put into the spotlight, Penelope's fight with Eloise further compounds the trauma of that night. Penelope isn't just having her romanticized idea of Colin shattered. This is a traumatic thing happening happening after her biggest secret was discovered by one of her best friends and it blew up into this giant rift between them. So they really had to give Penelope a double dose of drama to shock her out of her lifelong wallflower habits. The physical, emotional, and psychological transformation have to make sense in the narrative and they do because of this giant blow up. Now she will be able to speak more freely. Spinsters do not need chaperones. You are not a spinster. I am in my third year on the marriage mark with no prospects to show for it. What would you call that? Penelope cannot see Colin as an option because this is not the way of Netflix's Bridgerton. It is only when she is not seeing or pursuing him as her romantic love match that he will in fact be her romantic love match. This is the very broad narrative concept, the blueprint that has been laid out for how Netflix's Bridgerton subverts from Regency decorum for their main couples to get their turn in the spotlight. So just remember, the next time you hear me dragging Mr. No Thoughts Head Empty for being a payasada. Oh, wait a minute, I've already done that. <laughs> If you're a ride or die pollen shipper, I'm not saying that any of this was the incorrect way to tell his story as a character or the Colin Penelope romance. If Penelope O. Featherington is going to get her endgame, she needs to be able to speak freely outside the confines of Regency rigidity. And now she can, and I for one am hopeful that she will unleash some sharp verbal barbs on him, giving the satisfaction of her getting a little payback purely for my entertainment. Next and burn! What is she doing? Just a good have a nice day. The instant watching the show or making videos about it stops being fun, that'll be it. I won't bother anymore. And I can't think of anything more fun for Mr. No Thoughts Head Empty than him having to learn a whole other side of Penelope O. Featherington that he had no idea about before this. The side that she never felt free to share because society would not allow it. When it comes to Netflix's Bridgerton, the more misbehavior there is, the more fun things become. It's a bomb! What? Oh, I know. Wait for my birthday. Thank you all for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, because when we finally hit 30K subscribers on this channel, Kimiko will be getting a new shirt and she would really like to model it for all of you. But on my last Bridgerton video, 67% of the viewers were not even subscribed to me. And Kimiko does not appreciate having her fashion game blocked. Should I block it? Yeah. I'm a block it. Next Bridgerton video will come probably soonish. I don't know exactly when the new trailer will drop. I don't know if they will release any more clips of the show. It feels like now would be about the correct time to drop a trailer or at least a teaser trailer. I don't know if they'll release a teaser and a trailer, but whatever comes next, as long as it's something available in widescreen, circle back. I'm pretty sure I will have plenty of things to say. Bye. What? Your mouth is so big. Oh my God. I know. Well, that was uh, rather direct. Um. Um. <clears throat>